We've now seen how to use one-time signatures in order to sign, well, we've seen up to 256 bits, but that means we can generalize it to any number of bits. But it's kind of sad if you have all of this work, all of this lot of storage for the public keys, and then just throw it away after one single message. And that's kind of the obvious problem with one-time signatures. And so already in the same year that Lamput came up with the Lamput signature scheme, Merkel suggested to uh, combines several of these Lamput signature scheme using what is now called a Merkle tree. So here you see an example which can sign eight different messages. So all of these eight messages are captured by all these different eight uh, keys are captured by one single public key. Now what we have with the leaves here are S1 to S8, those um, are signature uh, secret key public key pairs so S8 given to P8, S1 given to P1 to P8. Um, those are Lamport signature schemes or Winterness signature schemes. So those are at the leaves, any of the one-time signature schemes that you like. And then we're hashing them together pairwise in order to get the next levels until we reach the root of the tree. So in this case, with eight one-time signatures, we'll have P15 on top of it. And then the way that signatures or the hash functions are working is if any piece in the tree changes, like you're flipping a bit in S5 or you're flipping a bit in P2, um, you will get a different value on the top. Now, each of the leaves can be used only once, but this P15 can be used eight times. So let's look at how that works. So, for instance, for the first signature that you, uh, for the first message that you want to sign, we're using S1, so that's the secret key of the one-time signature scheme, and that links to P1 as the matching public key. And so, as normal, we sign M using S1, using our secret keys, and then, well, we would need to use P1 for the verification. But the verifier doesn't have P1, the verifier only knows the P15, that doesn't know anything along the tree. And so what a signature using Merkle trees has to do is provide all the partners so that in the end one can compute P15 and match it up. Okay, so S1 and P1 you can compute, well you provide and you can verify the signature there. And then in order to compute P9, the verifier also need P2. Then in order to compute P13, well they could get the bottom levels, but it's actually enough to give them one level down. So the sibling of P9, which is P10. And then over on the other side, well, once you have P13, you're getting P14, and then you can compute P15. So to verify this signature, which contains, well, first of all, the output of signing M under S1, N, P1, P2, P10, P14, you first verify this with a one-time signature scheme, against P1, and then you're linking this P1 against the rest of the tree to the public key by computing all of these hashes. Well, so this is a candidate P9, so it's P9 prime, it's a candidate P13, so P13 prime, and comparing this thing with the P15, which is stored for the hash. So that's the public key. And so each of those eight one-time signatures can be used and linked against P15. So if you are now at the sixth message, so then you're releasing something related to S6 in your partner's signature, you provide P6, and you have to get all the siblings. So you have to get P5, then people can compute P11, you have to get uh, P12, so people can get P14, and of course also on the other side you have to provide the P13 to then compute the P15. So for the path from the S6 to the root, you have to compute, that you have to provide in the signature, the respective siblings. Now that you can generalize from eight time signatures to any power of two signatures, so in general with Merkle trees you can compute a fixed number of messages, so there's typically a power of two, you have two to the end leaves, and then all of these one time signatures are captured in a single hash value, the public key. So that means the public key is very very short, it's just the, the root of the tree there, 
but if you're looking at the signature then well it needs to have for each of the level um, the matching sibling so they're n level for a tree with two to the n leaves and of course you have to have the one time signature when you're setting up this system looking at like the slide here so in order to compute p15 you need to get all the one time signatures so here eight over internal two to the n for all of those you need to generate the secret keys and the public keys and you need to hash them pairwise so at that point you need to compute every single node in this tree so that's a rather expensive thing for computing the public key and of course then also for the signature you well you need to provide the partners and the cheapest for the computation is to store all of these leaves but of course you can again similar to internets and lambert you can trade off between storing and computing and the most extreme case is that even all of these one-time signature keys are coming from a single seed so you would be having a, just a 256-bit seed which then deterministically generates all these secret keys and then from all these secret keys you can compute all the public keys for the one-time signature scheme and then all the tree above of course that means then when you generate a signature you have to rebuild the tree in order to get the siblings for the nodes. So here are the two extreme cases, lots of storage or very little storage and lots of computation. Now one way out of this is that you build a tree of trees. Say you have on top a small tree and then under each of these leaves, which is a one-time signature, you have another tree and maybe another tree and maybe another tree. And then the bottom tree is what signs messages and then the tree above it well when you generate a public key you just fix this top key that tree and then when you start signing then okay you need to generate everything to down here and then you're again good for the next two to the end messages until you have to sign another tree over and so on and a colleague of mine here in Eindhoven Andreas Hösing um, he in his PhD thesis in 2013 worked out a, a very nice optimal schedule so that basically each signature has about the same effort uh, to compute and a lot cheaper than what you probably expect from, from seeing the last slide. So that makes actually these few time signature uh, pretty practical. Um, we don't call them few time signatures, we call them stateful hash based signatures because you need to know how many um, signatures you have already issued you need to be able to basically count so once I have used S1 I might, may never use S1P1 again because it's a one-time signature scheme okay so short rundown again so it's just one single prerequisite we only need a good hash function which we need anyway and it's very well researched it's an old idea um, it's also very easy to argue why this thing is post quantum there's just no hook where you could get, say, a Shaw's algorithm in there. And so we really understand how the security works. And for most instantiations, this is pretty fast. It's not so fast if you go for the minimal um, secret key of just a C, but typically it's very fast. The cons are that the signature is getting pretty big because you always have to product all the siblings up the tree. And again, there are some trade-offs that are possible. And then Langley, who works for Google, um, is quite negative about the set, uh, setting of stateful hash functions. So if you ever would reuse a subkey, like one of the leaves at the bottom, then you're breaking all your security. Say, remember the Windernet example, or uh, sorry, the example example, where once you've signed 11 and then use the same key to sign 7, then people also can sign 3 and 15. And well, forgeries should not happen. Now, He's working for Google, which is having lots of servers, is often using virtual machines. And when you're in that setting, then, well, okay, your virtual machine remembers some knowledge of how many signatures it's done. But virtual machines you can shut down and reboot. And at that point, you're back to where you thought last. So you're having a virtual machine, the image says number three. Then you run, you sign up to 11, you shut down the virtual machine, it wakes up in three again. That's certainly not a possibility. But there are lots of other situations where we need to have 
a good control of how many signals we have issued already. So if you're thinking operating system updates or, or code signing, then you have um, somebody keeping track of how many operating system updates there were already. There's a clear procedure of who is allowed to release something, nothing is happening just randomly. There's not, oh, I do something and you do something on your virtual machine. We better keep track of who is releasing code so that we don't have any interaction. And so for those um, use cases, it's actually quite feasible to, to use stateful hash-based signatures. And that was a good argument. And so um, CFIG, which is the research arm of the ITF, so it's the CryptoForum Research Group, they posted what's basically, well, internet standards. So they're called requests for comments, but it basically means, well, they've standardized these things. Uh, what you see here is the, the title pages from both of those. So one, which does include Alex Hülsing, is called XMSS, which stands for Extended Merkle Signature Scheme. And the other end is the LMS, which is the Light Mikali Hatchbase Signature Scheme. So those two are now fully specified. So if you're in an application where you actually want to use post quantum signatures and you can handle state, here they are ready for you. I've mentioned NIST a few times. So NIST is running this big competition on post quantum cryptography, but they wanted to have normal signature schemes. So they didn't ask for stateful hash based signatures, but they just did a separate process and have already gone ahead and actually standardized most of the schemes that were also specified from the CFIG. So XMSS and LMS are now also NIST standards. And ISO, which is another international um, standards organization, they have now started a group to also figure out how to standardize stateful hash-based signatures. So the story is, is fairly easy for stateful hash-based signatures. It gets a lot more interesting if you want to use these ingredients to build stateless hash-based signatures.